the ketone will have the higher boiling point. Notice that the molecules are exactly identical. Oh, thank you, whoever started recording. I am going to also start recording. OK, well, I'll be recording. No, no, don't don't stop recording. Whoever started recording, just keep recording. Um, the ketone plus the ether will have a higher boiling point than the ester. Absolutely. That was not the case with the question you got. The question you got had a ketone, acetone, and an ester, methyl acetate. Those have different boiling, those have different molecular weights. Right? Like the, uh, the methyl acetate has an extra carbon. Sorry, it has an extra oxygen. Not an extra carbon. It has an extra oxygen. So and I was like, no, it doesn't have an extra carbon, John. That's wrong. Um, it's pretty close. Ketones are pretty good, but you have to take into account the molecular weight. Um, and I said that in class. And so this is about as small difference as you can get. And the, es the ester wins by about a degree Celsius. If I'm right, I think it's 55 and 56. It's pretty close, but that extra molecular weight takes into account. Uh, it needs to be taken into account. If they're exactly the same molecule, same molecular weight, like up here, it's absolutely true. Here, they are not the same molecular weight, so you can't make that call. Uh, the other reason I felt very safe about that is you should have been naming molecules, and I thought somebody's going to Google this because these are nice small molecules, so everyone could have been able to name that, and you could find the boiling points on Wikipedia. So, um, what I want to talk today are about, uh, so all the, yeah, an alcohol, all, yeah, an alcohol, that extra hydrogen bond, you can have a lower molecular weight and still win. Again, molecular weight must be taken into account. Um, but methanol, I think, is above 60 degrees. I can't remember exactly what the boiling point is, but that's just a single methyl group. The, the hydrogen bond takes you up. Like, it's alcohols are always pretty much, no, they're not, because it's easy to get a, something like a ketone or an ester that's above 60 degrees. We have to have a lot more molecular weight. So you need to consider molecular weight. You need to consider boiling point. So what I want to talk about is thinking about. So I got some good questions. How can we rank resonance structures? It's really important. What I want to get to before that is I want to rank the stability of charges. Then resonance structures come underneath that. And to rank resonance structures, you need to understand what makes a charge stable, what makes a charge unstable. So there are four things. I'm going to turn my camera on because I am waving my arms around like a crazy person and it is lost posterity if my camera's dark. So there are four things that we need to consider when we're thinking about a charge and is a charge stable? And again, I think is my charge stable is the question you need to be asking yourself throughout this course. Like this is the course. Um, I'm going to use a stable charge and a happy charge interchangeably because I think of the charges as happy if they're stable um, because I'm psychotic. So the four things are one nature of the atom. Two resonance. Three hybridization. Of atom with charge. and which orbital charge is in. I'm going to put in in quotation marks because a positive charge isn't really in an orbital. It's kind of there's an empty orbital, so is it in it? I don't know, but it's from an empty orbital. For induction. That's it. Only three, only four things. Easy peasy. So we're going to take those things apart. Now, each of these is made up of multiple different subcomponents because of course it is just to make things difficult. So what I want to talk about first is nature of the atom. And this comes into two things. 
size electronegativity. Okay, so we're talking about this in the context of acid base equilibria. Let's let's stick with that. So let's say we had an example. Like that, ammonia plus hydroxide is in equilibrium with um, amide and because of course it's called amide, it's not the same thing as an amide bond, but this is, I'm sorry, I, again, and water. OK, so the question I can ask here is A, draw an arrow going from the left to the right, like draw the proper arrow to show how you're taking the things on the left and turn them into the things on the right. Part two, which way does the equilibrium lie? Part three, why does the equilibrium lie that way? And which way, I, and when I say which way does an equilibrium lie, I mean, where is the material gathering? Which, um, what is the major product? Uh, what is the more stable charge is essentially what I'm asking with that question. And that's how every equilibrium that involves a charge goes, is where is the more stable charge? Every equilibrium depends on where is the greater stability. And if there's something charged, it's all going to be about the charge. OK, so just take a second. Um, what we probably have to do to draw this properly is I'll have to draw this out in a Lewis structure. Otherwise, it's awfully hard. So take a second to draw that out. Um, I see I see your question, Hannah. So when do we know when molecular weight has priority over polarity? Molecular weight. If there's hydrogen bonds, polarity normally wins unless there's a big discrepancy in molecular weight. What is a big discrepancy? It varies. I'm sorry. Um, I. I think we won't ask you anything that 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 is a high that's not absolutely clear. Um, that's not on, on like a, a big formal evaluation, so it would be similar molecular weight molecules we'd be comparing and then polarity would normally win for the alcohol. Um, the esters and ketones are very close. It uh, the dipole moment is very small in both of them and so Normally, molecular weight wins with esters and ketones. I can't think of a single example of a linear, not a cyclic, but a linear ketone that has a higher boiling point than the ester that is one atom bigger. I don't think, I think molecular weight always wins there. Okay, so hopefully how you drew your arrow was you drew the arrow coming from a lone parent option. It can be any of them. Doesn't matter which one, going to any of the hydrogens on a nation. Again, doesn't matter which one, they're all the same. And then you have an arrow going from the bond between a nitrogen and a hydrogen directly onto the nitrogen. I felt that question was fair because it was kind of integrating the naming and the boiling point um, molecular weight stuff, and you had 48 hours to, to think about it. And I thought some people would Google it, and I'm sure some people did. Um, but it's also just muck weight is really important for these things. So we have this. We go to the product. That's the correct arrow. That will be a full mark answer for part one. OK, part two. Which way does the equilibrium lie? Uh, Alan jumped in with a left. Mohammed, we're going to come to that. We'll, we'll talk about resonance stuff. Does anyone disagree with left?
OK, I guess no one disagrees with left. Why to the left? Okay, Madison uh, says right because N is more electronegative. So I'm going to ask you the question, Madison, is N more electronegative? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're absolutely right. More electronegative is what matters. But uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so in the fourth year of my PhD, we had this thing called the Chemistry Olympiad, uh, which was just a excuse to get drunk and play games uh, for PhD students at Ottawa. And one of the challenges that we had to do was recreate the periodic table. Uh, our team finished dead last because seven organic chemists couldn't remember which way nitrogen and oxygen went. And we put nitrogen, uh, oxygen before nitrogen, so we screwed up everything below it. And we were organic chemists, and so we know like six elements, so we were in real trouble. The inorganic people cleaned up because they know where all the elements go in that main block that all the elements that nobody cares about. Uh, so I've made that precise mistake before of transposing nitrogen and oxygen. But oxygen yeah, no, it, it absolutely I've done it. Um, I completely understand. But that's why you're allowed to have periodic table next to you, so you don't need to memorize that shit. OK, um, yeah, so it lies to the left, and that's because oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. It actually is that simple. So in a row, electronegativity matters. OK, next example. OK, so again, I ask you guys to draw the arrow. Which way does the equilibrium lie and why? OK, so hopefully you can draw the arrow. The electrons on a fluorine, any of the lone pairs of the fluorine, attack the hydrogen atom. And when they do that, hydrogen is trying to make two bonds, one to fluorine, one to iodine. It can't do that. It's hydrogen. It can only make one bond. It only has one orbital. So it breaks the bond to iodine, and the two electrons in the hydrogen-iodine bond go into iodine. Right, because larger atomic radii, right, right. OK, you guys are actually watching the lectures. So. In a column. Size matters. Bigger atoms. Stabilized negative charge is better. They stabilize positive charge. Everything is also inverted. So if you have a positive charge, all these rules are backwards, which is easy. OK. Uh, and that's absolutely right. And if we actually want to look at the values here, like this is actually a really extreme uh, thing. Like hydrogen fluoride is great stuff. It's really good for dissolving bone but the pKa is only 3.1. So it's about as acidic as lemon juice. So it's not really very acidic. Like acetic acid is 2.53. So acetic acid is actually more acidic than HF. It's just HF is um, really, 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 really dangerous. HI, on the other hand, has a pKa of minus 9.5. That's a humongous difference. You will never see as big differences from almost any other effect as which atoms are carrying charge. You see similar effects up there. I think I should know this. Um, this guy's about water's 14. That's easy. Nitrogen uh, amine is about 25. 
have to look it up precisely, but it's in that ballpark. Uh, and then like methyl, like CH4, which is one atom over, is like 41. So it's this huge jump as you go along the row. Smaller jump as you go down a column, but still humongous differences in pKa, like lots of orders of magnitude. And what's really important here is that size dominates over electronegativity in the column, because in the column, fluorine is a lot more electronegative than iodine. Like a lot more electronegative than iodine. Like fluorine is the most electronegative atom there is. Iodine still stabilizes the negative charge better because it's bigger. It's got more places to hide a negative charge. OK, so let's take another example. So let's say we have this guy. And again, negatively charged oxygen, so we've got six electrons. Just drawing the ones on the charges. Again, same questions. Draw the arrow. Um, which way is the uh, equilibrium lie and why? And just to make this, just make the arrow drawing a little easier, let's draw a bond. Yeah, size takes priority over electron activity in a column, so size is more important. It's all about size. One of the challenges I have um, teaching large undergraduate classes, and like I have lots of challenges teaching large undergraduate classes in chemistry, I'm sure you've noticed. But one of them I have is my way of thinking about analogies in chemistry is absolutely obscene in every single case. And I cannot share my natural obscene analogies with a class of undergraduates um, because I probably would be brought up on all sorts of questions. So the, the analogies I use that make sense of things for me um, don't work. So I, instead I will stick with um, uh, plausible deniability of innuendo. And so we'll just stick with size matters here. Anyway, so if you're drawing arrows. And I actually don't mind doing as much in class thing where nobody's recording, but I'm recording this and sticking it up on YouTube for our sake. So yeah, no, not doing that. So um, We've got this. Hopefully that's the arrow you drew. Again, any of the lone pairs on the oxygen. Attack the hydrogen. Break the hydrogen oxygen bond. The electrons in the hydrogen oxygen bond go on to the oxygen. Hopefully you are getting very bored of these arrows now. Good. If you are, great. If you're confused by them, uh, please, please, please read the section in the textbook on arrow drawing again and again and again. And I recommend Khan Academy actually has a pretty good video on arrow drawing. I would use that as well. OK, so we've got that. Cool, that's the arrows. Which way is the equilibrium line? Left, left because it has a larger radii. OK, so. Um, but the charge is on oxygen. So oxygen and oxygen have the same radii. OK, so Braden's saying induction from the sulfur. I. Induction is going to be stronger from oxygen because oxygen is more electronegative. Induction goes entirely by electronegativity. Guntas says resonance. That's the magic word because we have not analyzed these charges properly yet. 
if all you did is you drew this and went, yay, I'm done, um, you have to consider, is that charge stabilized? And yes, it is by resonance. So switch colors. OK, so if we look at these. Suddenly now we've seen a difference. We're trying to figure out a difference between the two charged species. Whenever you have an equilibrium, you're trying to determine which way it goes, like an acid base thing. You're trying to figure out what is the difference between the things on the left and the right. And here the difference is they have different resonance structures because they both have the same amount of resonance, but one is able to delocalize the charge onto sulfur, whereas the other one's not. And because we're able to get the charge on sulfur, sulfur's got a bigger electronegative, a bigger radius than oxygen. And so sulfur can stabilize the charge better than oxygen. So when this guy's contributing to the resonance structure, it's stabilizing the charge better. So it's making this one more stable. So the equilibrium lies to the left. So Christian asked a really important question. Would it be very wrong to draw the arrow from the H to the O because that's what it ends up bonding to? Or do the arrows always need to be from the electrons? The answer is yes, it would be very wrong to draw the let arrow from the H to the O because the arrows are what the electrons are what are moving. The arrow means. Like one of these double headed arrows like this means two electrons are going from here to there. That is what the arrow means. Um, it's kind of like saying, if I tell you, um, Pat hit Tom. Like we have a convention there and it is clear that Pat is doing the hitting and Tom is being the hitty. That is not the same thing as saying Tom hit Pat. And if we didn't, because uh, then Tom would be hitting Pat. Poor Pat, poor Tom. Like this, this is really violent. But none of those, like we we only define that because of the way we define the verb hit. We define verb hit as somebody as me being active, and we say that the thing before it is the subject, and the thing after it's the object. But that's arbitrary, right? We could redefine English to say Tom hit Pat to mean that Pat's punched and Tom got hit. Um, of course, we can't think that way because we have this way of thinking and we have this way of thinking and communicating so we all understand what the hell everybody else is saying. So it's the same thing with these arrows. The arrow means goes from electrons to the place. And if you invert that, then you're basically confusing everybody. So there are rules. So, because, uh, so Mohammed said, so because of resonance, the charge moves to S. And because of that, equilibrium is to the left, correct? Because S is bigger. I'm going to modify your language a little bit there, Mohammed. Because of resonance, the charge is delocalized onto both oxygen and sulfur. The charge isn't moving. The charge was always on both of them. We're drawing a second structure because our piddly little minds can't conceive of the electron clouds around these things. We need to draw Lewis structures to make sense of it. But the, char the charge isn't moving. The charge was always on both of them. Um, but yes, because S is larger than oxygen and there's no sulfur on the right and there's a sulfur on the left. The sulfur on the left can better stabilize the negative charge, which reduces, the, which increases the stability or reduces the energy of that system. I, I know it sounds really pedantic to say when you're saying resonance structure and the charge moves, it's like, oh, come on, charge moved. Uh, and even I slip up on that, but I think it's it's just really important that when we're thinking about this, that you're not thinking that resonance structures are flipping back and forth between each other. They're, if you have seven resonance structures for a molecule, those all exist at the same time. They're not rapidly interconverting. They all exist at the same time and are kind of estimating the relative density and location of the electrons in the system. Um, but that's because the electrons are not particles, right? Electrons are waves. And so putting them on a single atom is incorrect. They're kind of smeared over the orbitals. How come the oxygen on the right have two bonds and three lone pairs? 
Um, because I'm wrong, that's why. I uh, just I inverted where I put the negative charge. I'm sorry about that. You're absolutely right. That was an error. Thank you for catching that though. Amanda. Yes, so close. So Amanda said, so the charge is delocalized over a larger area and that's why it's on the left. Um, but let me just make sure because I think you might be absolutely right and I just want to make sure we're talking about the same thing when you're saying area. The sulfur is bigger than oxygen, so a charge delocalized on sulfur is over a larger surface area, larger volume really than in our auction because like you know it's a sphere right sulfur is a sphere so there's and the orbitals are not spheres but they're kind of like spheroid sp3 orbitals um sp2 orbitals i guess that's true so on the atoms themselves let's talk about that if we're talking about resonance as a whole the total area the total volume that the charge is delocalized over the oxygen and the sulfur is about the same on both sides it's just there's a sulfur on one side OK, perfect. Yeah, Amanda, you're absolutely right. So sulfur is bigger than oxygen. It's got a bigger volume. It can better stabilize the negative charge. If I can get the negative charge onto sulfur, that's better than having it on oxygen. The molecule on the left, I can get onto sulfur. The molecule on the right, I can't. But the resonance is important too. Because. Next example. And this time I'll be very careful to draw the right number of lone pairs. OK, same freaking question. Arrow, which way, why? Okay, hopefully that's not giving anyone any trouble. Again, Tom's hitting Pat. I guess. If you want to amorphize your acetate is slapping mercapto ethanol around. Um, and then equilibrium going to the right. Okay. So we got answers going right and left. A lot of guys are saying right. So you're getting and good test is going left with the and somebody's going, oh, never mind. Left because of resonance. OK, so. This is where we're queuing up. Issues against each other. And I'm sorry for this. The PKAs of these guys. Uh, about 4.5. For carboxylic acid around nine for a thiol. So the carboxylic acid is more acidic, so the equilibrium lies to the left. And again, it's because we've got resonance. Resonance almost always wins. I want to say that if you've got resonance involving oxygen in almost every case, the resonance is the most important thing in there. Uh, and I'm not going to give you uh, edge cases on an evaluation. We'll talk about some edge cases here, but that, that's not going to happen on an evaluation. That's not fair. Um, but resonance almost always wins. So yes, sulfur is bigger. Yes, sulfur stabilizes a negative charge better. Unfortunately, that sulfur has a full minus one on it with no charge delocalization other than, you know, lots of volume on the sulfur. Whereas over here, each of those oxygens just has half a negative charge. It's a lot better. Uh, red, no. Um, 
atom tends to win over resonance when they are not in the same column. So uh, we'll, we'll sum these up afterwards. In the same column, resonance almost always, almost always wins. Uh, it might vary on the amount of resonance up in different columns, like nitrogen versus oxygen. Um, normally the atom matters, but you can overcompensate for that with enough resonance. And you always have to be careful because often resonance changes your atoms because you can localize the charge onto different atoms. And suddenly you're not talking about nitrogen, you're talking about oxygen. Uh, you can compare size when that's all you've got left, Alan. When you tie everything else up, you can. it comes down to size of the atom. So if we take another example. Uh, I don't know if this is easier or harder. So now all of our atoms are carbon. There's no oxygen, there's no nitrogen, there's no sulfur. Same questions, arrow, direction, why? So a lone pair on hydrogen, on a carbon, means that there's two hydrogens there, or a negative charge and a lone pair. Hopefully that's how you're gonna draw your arrow from the lone pair to the hydrogen, break the hydrogen carbon bond. Absolutely the same as every sets of arrows we've drawn so far. Okay. So Mohammed is saying right. Other opinions? Or Mohammed, do you want do you want to say why right? But everything's a carbon. Right, because more carbons for induction. Um, I'm going to wave on that because it's not really carbons are carbons. There's not a lot of dip, there's not a lot of polarity in there. So the carbon isn't really able to stabilize or not. Guntas and Braden both are much like I, I like the definite like the, the certainty of Mohammed and uh, and they are uh, both both have there are no question marks for them. Guntas and Braden both gave us a left question mark. Right, because there are more resin structures to stabilize. So. Let's let's stay with that, Grace. Um, try so for resin structure. What what do we need for that to, for because I imagine we're talking about the negative charge. So what do we need for it to be able to do resonance? If it's got a negative charge in the orbital there, what needs to what needs to be the hybridization of the adjacent atom? Perfect. Great. Thanks, Grace. Awesome. Good call. Because this guy is SP3. No, like and and I and that that was a that was a you you, you figured it out and that's absolutely key. Um, thanks. I like I am that that was absolutely the perfect way to think about that because eventually you can start looking at something, think you see something, just you have to walk through it. This atom here is sp3, it makes four bonds, so there's no way it has a p orbital. It can't do anything with this negative charge, and it would need a p orbital to maybe be able to do anything or accept electrons. Whereas this guy over here, hey look, it's got resonance. So those of you who've been going left and thinking hey, there's resonance there, why is everyone saying right? Um, it's left. Nothing special there, it's just. Well, it's resonance is always special, but nothing super special. Right, perfect, Grace, absolutely perfect. Great, Christian, absolutely right. That is exactly what you need. I cite double bond next to it is good. We'll also accept an, a P orbital next to it. 
but because the one has a pure orbital, it's kind of like the the don't the orbital, an empty p orbital or a movable p orbital. I'm happy with the double bond. You're going to be right 99.9% .9 of the time, unless there's like a positive charge next to it. And then you're going to make a double bond. So I'm being really picky. I'll give you the double bond. That's good enough. Perfect. Nothing special here. It's a little freaky because we don't have an atom that we're really buying blue, like oxygen or sulfur or nitrogen or something. All we got is carbons. Take a deep breath. Look for the difference. Resonance is a difference here. People are looking for induction. It's all carbon atoms. None of the carbons are dragging a lot of density anywhere. It's all pretty much a wash on that. OK. Next example I want to do, uh, and what I want to do is I'm going to actually phrase this a little bit differently because I don't think you have the information to get this. If any of you, unless you've like looked ahead in the lecture notes, um, and I'm not sure if I talked about this initially when I talked about charge stability. So I think it's buried like in lecture 20 or something. But I think we should discuss it. Because we're just talking about charges, so might as well talk about charges. OK, I've got two. I'm rephrasing the questions here a little bit to guide us through this. First of all, arrow, same question. Draw the arrow, draw the mechanism that takes you from so that arrow thing is called a mechanism. Draw that going from the left to the right. Second thing. What is the hybridization of the orbital? That the charge is in. On the on the two charged species. Third question. Which of those orbitals is closer to the nucleus? And is being close to the nucleus good for a negative charge stability? So three questions. Draw the arrow. Second, identify the orbital that the negative charge is in on both structures. And then third, it, which of those orbitals is closer to the nucleus and is being close to the nucleus good for being a negative charge? Arrow hopefully is pretty simple. So everyone's going to get at least one out of three for this question. It's a freebie. Uh, right is closer to nucleus SP. OK, we'll do the arrows one more time. OK, I got, I got distracted. Um, I'm trying to figure out where this is. So charges on SP. This guy, what's the charge in? SP, yeah, left is SP. I'm going to go with uh, Dib Jot, who is an orbital master. So we've got an SP3, we've got an SP, and we've got um, uh, Fatima saying the charge is on SP orbital, and that's closer to the nucleus, and that's absolutely right. SP closer to nucleus. Because it's got more S character, and S is close to the nucleus. So P is further from a nucleus than S, so an SP3 has got a lot more P in it. S has got a lot more S in it. OK. Now I agree with I agree with part one of Fatima's answer. I disagree with part two of Fatima's answer. So what's the charge? Is nucleus negatively or positively charged? Yeah, a nucleus is positive. Carolyn has delivered the answer. Best to be close to a nucleus because the nucleus is positively charged. So if you can get a negative charge closer to a nucleus, your charges are closer together. 
you want to keep your positive charges apart, you want to keep your negative charges apart, but you want to bring your negatives and positives together. So, so if I'm actually looking, if again, if we're interested in PKAs, if you're if you're a PKA junkie, none of you are PKA junkies, please. I have a colleague who is, and he's weird. Um, again, about 41, 40, give or take, something like that, 25. That's 16 orders of magnitude. That's ridiculous. Like this hybridization thing is freaking huge. Um, it's really biggest for SP. The, the, the SP2 thing's not as big a deal. And it's really only really a problem for carbon because oxygen and nitrogen um, tend to do weird things with their orbitals. But for carbon, this is a really big deal. Uh, nucleus, is, so Matt asked, can you explain why being close to a nucleus is good again? Nucleuses are positively charged. Electron pairs are negatively charged. Charges like being near each other to cancel each other out. So you're canceling out part of the positive charge of the nucleus, which stabilizes it. Ideally, you know, in a, in a perfect universe that wasn't quantum, you know, everything would collapse. The positive charge and the negative charge would all join together and make everything, every, every, atom, every particle would be neutral. Um, so if there was a positive charge would be more stable as farther from the nucleus. Absolutely, Jonathan. So a positive charge prefers to sit in an sp3 orbital than an sp orbital, with the humongous caveat that a positive charge doesn't want to be a positive charge, and so if it possibly can, I'll do resonance. But all else being equal, the positive version of this thing on the left has never been observed. You can't make it. It's too unstable. You can't. Lose a hydride from there. So this is. It's kind of a loose thing about hybridization, I guess you could call this. So which of the four does this fall under? It's got to do with the hybridization of the atom of the of the orbital that the electron is in. Well, let's be careful about that, Fatima, because SP, uh, SP, yeah, no, SP is a lower energy orbital. And the electrons are in the lower energy orbital. That's true. I'm trying, but that, that's not the reason why, but I'm trying to think if you're right in all cases, and so I can just say sure. And I don't know. Um, it's more about distance to the nucleus than it is about the energy of the orbital. But distance to the nucleus is dependent on the energy of the orbital. I think you're right. I think you're right. I think saying that putting the electrons in a lower energy orbital is more stable. Uh, with the caveat, of course, they're not doing resonance, they're not doing anything else. I, I'm going more for the minimizing charge separation that Aryan's pointing out here. But I think the energy of the orbitals is partially determined by minimizing charge separation. So we're kind of walking around in circles here. Yes. OK. Um, almost at the end of the lecture, so let's do something a little bit trickier. Okay, so I'm going to, you know what, I can ask this question a whole lot of ways. I could have drawn in an acid base reaction, blah, 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 It'll be basically the same question. Because again, what I'm really asking is which of these charges is more stable. So let's say I ask which of these charges is most stable. And. Um, I'm going to add something else to it. Draw the resonance structures and rank the resonance structures. If you need to run to, uh, to a lab, um, 
go nuts. We're going to finish this example. Uh, you'll know to skip to the end of the lecture and catch up on this thing. So if you need to run, go ahead, but if not, start drawing resonance structures. And we'll go over how to use the arrows with this again. So we start with this guy on the right because he's a simpler molecule. There's a few ways you could draw this. If you're following sort of the stepwise rules, and that's fine. And I'm saying you can skip the one I've just drawn. The reason you can skip this middle one and go directly to this one, and the way you would do that would be these blue arrows, is that this middle one's got four charges instead of two. Um, anything that has more than the minimum, like minimum number of charges really isn't going to be that important. You'll be safe to leave it out. I think the only time you go looking for that is if you have a completely neutral molecule and you want to kind of understand how a bond is polarized. You draw a resonance structure that's charged like acetone. You would draw the resonance structure with the O minus and the C plus, and you just create two charges of none. Um, acetone doesn't sit like that, right? Acetone really does have a carbonyl bond there most of the time. We can draw that. And the other resonance structure is if you go the other way. Again, I'm just going to do two at once. So again, what I'm indicating, I'll do to be a little bit clearer with this one, is the arrow comes from the lone pair on the carbon. The arrow goes to a blank page. The arrow goes to the space between the two carbons to generate the new double bond that I'm going to generate. And then when I do that, when I make a new double bond here, this one here, this carbon here would be making five bonds, which isn't allowed. So it needs to break a bond. So I'm going to break a bond by using the arrow going from double bond. Doesn't matter which side of the double bond. I could have done from the top of the bomb. Doesn't matter. Goes to the adjacent carbon. And I'm saying I'm basically creating a new lone pair. So I'm using a lone pair to create a double bond and using a double bond to create a lone pair. And so we've kind of got three resonance structures. So this is the last charge thing we need to know about is a new example is here. So, actually, we don't. Uh, induction is going to dominate, so we're good. Induction's fine. Save myself with induction. Okay. Um, 
in all cases, all three cases, you should always look at the charge to figure out what's different between the charges in these three resonance structures. In all three cases, we have a negative charge on carbon in a p orbital. There's no way to get it out of a p orbital because if we take it out of a p orbital, it can't do resonance, right? So with resonance like this, it must always be in a p orbital. If it shifts out of a p orbital, it's not a resonance structure. So that's all the same. Atom is the same. The nature of the atom is the same. The hybridization is the same. Uh, they are resonant structures, and so you can't really have sort of like compare resonant structures by which of the structures has better resonance because they are resonant structures. So they all have resonance and the same resonance because they are resonant structures. So then we're coming down to two effects left. One of them is induction, and the second one is something called hyperconjugation. Uh, I will get to an example next class about hyperconjugation. All atoms same. Therefore, induction plus hyperconjugation. If you want to look up hyperconjugation, um, Decent description on Wikipedia. I keep editing it a little bit because I'm not super happy with it. And then some snot nosed kid keeps changing it back to a wrong description. Uh, not as good, not as thorough a description. Anyways, you know, or a Wikipedia editor, I think those are the same things. Induction plus hyperconjugation and um, are the things to consider. Because again, when all atoms are the same, if the atoms were different, then we would be considering that as well, but they're not. OK, I'm going to say that the hyperconjugation is kind of minor here. So I'm going to ignore it, and I'm not going to explain what it is either. We're going to, I promise, we'll come back to it next class. Um, so if we're looking at induction only, which of these has the strongest induction effect on the negative charge? And induction effects are stronger when you're close and they get weaker over space, over distance. So we always want to get charged as close as possible. Uh, well, let's just go with A, B, and C. B, B. I agree with all the Bs, right? Because you have a negative charge right next to a positively charged nitrogen. And we can't do anything with that nitrogen. It's really tempting to want to make a double bond with the nitrogen because you have a negative next to a positive. You really want to make a double bond and you can't because nitrogen is already using all of its orbitals. It's sp3 hybridized. It's making four bonds. It cannot accept electrons. You can't make a fifth bond to nitrogen. You're screwed. But nitrogen is pulling with all of its might on those electrons, right? Because it wants to be neutral. And so it's pulling negative out and the carbon wants to be neutral as well. So this is great. B is a very happy resonance structure. OK, what's the second best? Yeah, A, distance, induction. The charge in A is closer than the charge in C because the charge in C is way out on the end there, whereas A, it's still kind of close to the nitrogen, so it's still going to be feeling an inductive effect from nitrogen. So if we were drawing a resonance hybrid of this, so again, this is where we need to consider all these different features in here. If we're drawing a resonance hybrid of this, then you would draw single bonds for everything that is a, drawn to bonds that never change. The only thing that ever changes is a single bond skeleton. All the double bonds move. There's always a positive charge on that nitrogen. The overall charge in the molecule is zero because there's plus one, minus one. And then all that is dotted because there's a partial double bond through all there. 
in one of the important resonance structures at least, there's no bond between every one of those carbons. And now since we ranked the resonance structures and they're all minus one, number one gets the biggest negative charge because it carries the biggest negative charge because the negative charge is most stable there. Number two's got an intermediate negative charge and number three's got a small negative charge. I am not getting out my ruler to measure these. Um, Cause that's stupid, but just ballpark it. Okay, so the guy on the left has got all the same resonance structures. I know it's really tempting to want to use the fluorine to do some extra resonance, uh, but you, and I leave this as an exercise for you. Um, you can't without creating lots of extra charges. Fluorine can do resonance. Fluorine can donate electrons in. Problem is there are too many freaking electrons in the system already. And what do I mean by fluorine can donate electrons in? Well, let's draw the major resonance structure. We just discussed it. It's this one. This is what I would have to do to have fluorine participate in the resonance. There's a few things wrong with this. Uh, the first thing that's wrong with it is there are three charges and there's no way to get around that. The second thing that's wrong with it is you've got two negative charges next to each other. That is really, 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 really bad. Don't do that. So this is just bad. But overall on a molecule, is that charge more stabilized than on a molecule on the right? So left or right, which one's a more stable charge? Got one from Mouthwood or left. Right. Yeah, correct. It's like driving. Um, yeah, it's left and it's because the floor. I just drew the fluorine donating by resonance, but it withdraws by induction. The fluorine carbon bond, the fluorine is pulling electrons towards it, which weakens the negative charge on all the atoms. So if I draw the resonance hybrid of this, we'll be able to, you know, it's going to be very, very similar to the one on the left there. Again, big S negative on there. Moderate negative on here. Oops. Small negative here. And there'll be a little bit of a negative on the fluorine because the fluorine can pull electrons towards it. If you left that off, I'd be OK with that. But what I wouldn't be OK with is if you said the right one was more stable. The left one's more stable because you have Induction from the fluorine also pulling negative charges out of this negative charge, which is good. You're delocalizing that negative charge more, which is good. OK, I'm going to leave it there for today. Um, happy studying. Yeah, if the NH3 was left off, it would still be the F. The F would be even more important, right? Because we were, we're if we're deleting it from both sides, we have to delete the NH3 plus from both sides. If you deleted it just from the left hand side, um, the right would win. But if you took it off both molecules, then yeah, it would still be the one on the left. Induction's great from fluorine, but induction's even better from a positively charged species like nitrogen like that. Because it's positively charged. OK, um, thank you, everybody. 
I hope you have a good rest of your day. And thanks for everyone who anyone who was recording this. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, yeah, midterm is on October 23rd. I will send in a formal announcement with email as soon as I'm done this class because I keep saying I'm going to do that. So I'll send that to you. Happy studying. And if you're caught up with this stuff, we're just going to do more examples on Wednesday. <laughs>